Hey, welcome into another episode of the Fat Guy Podcast. I am the Fat Guy. Most people that know me just call me Brett. Glad to have you along today. If you don't follow me on social media, check us out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. The username is Fat Guy Podcast uh, across all those mediums. Uh, it's hard to say which one I'm more, more active on lately. I have to kind of gear myself up to get into social media and stuff. Probably Facebook or Instagram, one or the other. Either way, if you need to get up with me, absolutely those ways will work. So if you have a question or concern. Um, boy, great. Uh, this is this is going to be a good podcast. Uh, if you've listened before and thought, man, that wasn't the best podcast I've ever heard. Well, you'll be rewarded today. I'm going to tell you the number one way to lose weight. And if you so choose, it's possible you could lose weight by not changing anything you eat. Now, I hate saying things like that because it's kind of gimmicky and it gets people set up to think that, oh, I can still eat like a fat cow but be ripped like Arnold Schwarzenegger. And that's just not entirely true. It's not even close to being true, really. Um, that's what frustrates me um, about people who contact me about, uh, question me about the ketogenic diet or low carb or you know, intermittent fasting or carnivore or whatever. Um, But their questions always center around, how can I do that but still basically just eat the same things I eat now because there's no way I could give up insert name of food they could never give up here. I'm just going to tell you right now, you're probably never going to be successful if your attitude is, I could never give up and then insert some food there. I mean, if that's your attitude, you're you're just probably not going to be successful and not just because you can't see yourself giving that food up, but just because that's your attitude. Nevertheless, let's jump right into it. This would be the number one way that I would recommend for people to begin losing weight. And in that, not just losing weight, but begin to repair the internal metabolic uh, issues that have caused you to be obese and caused it for you to be uh, so hard to lose weight to begin with. And this is real exciting. Uh, we're, more and more, we're starting to see great studies, um, great literature coming out, more and more about things like low-carb, uh, keto, carnivore, fasting, that type of stuff, whereas we didn't have much of that before. And so it's good to be able to actually see peer-reviewed scientific research studies and papers that verify and confirm things that many of us have found out by listening to others and trying for ourselves. But you know, that's never considered scientific evidence because it's an N of 1. N of 1 means it's anecdotal, basically, is what that means. And uh, that's what makes this study so exciting. So uh, we're going to talk about the study, and then I'll do a little bit of details on what you should do to lose weight that I think is very reasonable. And I'll go through it step by step with you too. So if, you, if you're if you thinking, man, I wish somebody would just hold my hand and walk me through something. This podcast is for you. Hang on, we're going to get through it, I promise. So the name of this study is called The Effectiveness of Intermittent Fasting to Reduce Body Mass Index and Glucose Metabolism. This is a review and meta-analysis. Now, body mass index, obviously, you're going to lose weight. Um, and then to improve glucose metabolism, that's going to work on the internal things like insulin resistance and other things that lead to obesity and make it uh, very hard for people who have become obese to lose weight. This was just posted, by the way, on October the 7th in the Journal of Clinical Medicine. Um, If you look at the notes of this podcast, wherever you find this podcast at, if you look in the show notes section, You'll see a link to the study if you wish to check it out yourself. So let's talk about the method of the study first, which is the most exciting part. They looked at um, uh, clinical control uh, trials uh, only or uh, trials with some type of control in them. Um, the, The type trials had to involve intermittent fasting versus calorie restriction specifically. So is people who did intermittent fasting versus people who did, uh, you know, dieting, regular dieting, eat less, move more, that type thing. 
they found over 2,000 studies that referenced intermittent fasting of some sort, but they only chose the best of the best, the ones that had no controls or loose controls or the ones that only had one or two people in it or, you know, all these things that just make them highly unreliable because they wanted the best of the best data. And what they wound up was the best constructed studies with the best controls uh, that were used in place. Um, so it, may, it makes this uh, meta-analysis highly reliable. By the way, one thing I learned uh, way back in 2012 when I started studying nutrition and stuff, trying my best to help my mom beat cancer, was that there's different levels of studies. You know, you'll see these dramatic headlines in the news that say outrageous things, and it's this new study from here and this study from here. Once you get into looking at things like that, you find out that there's very different levels of studies. There are studies that are basically meaningless, going all the way up to what would be considered a, I guess the double-blind uh, study is con considered probably top of the top. But basically, once you get up there with uh, random controls, clinical controls, double-blinds, you're at the peak of the peak, and right up there at the top is the meta-analysis, especially when the meta-analysis only looks at the best of the best trials. So meta-analysis is looking at a bunch of different studies because, you know, one study may only have 20 people, one study may have 500 people, one study may have, uh, may have slightly more women than men, and then another study may have had slightly more men than women, and then a different study may have looked at people who were, you know, younger than 40. And then another study may have had some people that were over 40. And so what you get when, if you combine the, the ones that were conducted in the best possible way with the best possible controls, and you combine all those together, you get the widest swath, the best picture of what is likely to most resemble what will happen in reality, if that makes sense. So meta-analysis studies are right up there at the top as, as far as uh, uh, research goes. And the final thing I'll say is this, this uh, meta-analysis study did make it into the Journal of Clinical Medicine and it is peer-reviewed. And that's one of the final things is peer review. You can't just come up with a study and get it into something like the, the Journal of Clinical Medicine without being reviewed by peers. And so the fact that it made it there says a lot as well. There's just a lot of, to be taken from this. So let's jump right into it, shall we? BMI, body mass in index, was significantly reduced versus the calorie restriction only people. Now, let me go back to, to again to the premise of all these studies that were reviewed. They, it, it compared intermittent fasting. So just a brief discussion of intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting is ways of stretching the time between meals. So you could go 12 hours where you eat your meals and then decide that the next 12 hours you won't consume anything with calories. Uh, some people stretch it to 16 uh, no calories and then eat your meals within eight hours. Some people stretch it to 18 hours with no meals and then consume your food in a six hour window. Then it moves to 20 and four. Then it moves to 23 and one, which is commonly known as OMAD or one meal a day. And then it can even stretch into what's known as alternate day fasting, where you're, you're really going between 36 and 40 hours is basically what you're doing, and you're just eating every other day. And that's probably the maximum end of what's considered intermittent fasting. And not a lot of that is. Most people consider that a hybrid between intermittent and extended. So those uh, uh, different modalities of intermittent fasting we're all considered across these studies. Okay, so now that you know what we're looking at, we're on the other on the other hand, the calorie restriction groups in these studies were people that just ate less calories. You know, they still ate their three meals a day. They had their breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And they had snacks. You could, you know, you however you want it, you could have a snack between breakfast and lunch. You could have another snack between lunch and dinner. You could have a snack before bed. Whatever. Your overall goal was to just keep your calories down, right? Because that's what they tell you to do to lose weight. It's calories in, calories out. You just bring your calories down. So just to clarify what we're looking at. So body mass index significantly reduced versus just the calorie restriction group. Lean mass was preserved in the, in the intermittent fasting group versus lean mass lost in the calorie restriction group. And this has long been a huge benefit of intermittent fasting. There's this thing that kicks in when you fast 
um, your body goes into a, a lean uh, a lean tissue sparing mode, and so it won't allow your body to cannibalize its own lean tissue. And it also, uh, d- due to the mechanisms that happen when your insulin levels drop low during intermittent fasting, it's very easy for your body to access stored fat, so it doesn't have to cannibalize your lean muscle mass. Well, on the other hand, when you just do simple basic calorie restriction, um, you don't necessarily get those protections, and so your body may, and often does, uh, and as the study shows, cannibalize its own lean mass. So that's huge. Lean mass was actually preserved in the intermittent fasting group versus it was not in the calorie restriction group. Insulin resistance was reduced in the fasting group, not in the calorie restriction group. And insulin resistance is the whole problem with with being obese and not being able to lose the weight. Um, it creates this vicious cycle where it's nearly impossible for your body to effortlessly access fat stores and burn off fat as fuel. Um, fat mass decreased more in intermittent fasting than it did in the calorie restriction. So in other words, the body accessed stored fat and burned it better and born, burned more of it and the people who ex- who did the intermittent fasting than the people who just reduced calories. So intermittent fasting won in every significant way anything could win. Anything that you would want in, in improving your health and losing weight was way better in the intermittent fasting group than it was in the calorie restriction group. Confirming what I've said and what many others that I've followed and learned from have said, Calories in, calories out is stupid. The eat less, move more thing is just stupid. It just doesn't work. It doesn't address the the uh, uh, the true causes of of obesity. Now, let me clarify that you have to reduce calories to eat. Now, there's a lot of people say, "Well, you, you go keto, or you go low carb, or you do intermittent fasting. You can you can eat as much as you want and and do the, that magic that happens inside. You lose weight. Oh, well, that's not true." Calories were reduced in both groups, in the intermittent fasting group and in the calorie restriction group. Um, The difference is is how it was reduced. And I don't know if you've ever tried intermittent fasting or not, but as you stretch that fasting window out and you have less time to eat meals, you just by default eat less food. Like you don't have to count any calories. You just have less time to eat, so you just eat less. It's it's just a natural side effect or effect. Um, a natural benefit of intermittent fasting. Uh, Make no mistake, any weight loss that happens in somebody will be because they consumed less calories. Um, There's other studies that I've referenced that I won't mention here because that's not the subject of this podcast, but there's other, other studies that I have referenced and seen And actually, they may have made it into this meta-analysis. I don't know. I haven't looked at the 12 separate studies individually to know. But in the past, there have been very well-done studies that showed that somebody that ate a ketogenic diet eating the exact same number of calories um, that they always ate compared to a person who ate the exact same number of calories uh, on like the standard American diet or whatever, um, the keto person would either maintain or lose and the uh, standard American diet group would gain. So that shows that a calorie is not a calorie because you're choosing what type of calories you put in your body. But with that being said, generally speaking, there has to be some form of calorie reduction, although you appear to need much less of it when you uh, are implementing things like intermittent fasting and then especially choosing what type of calories go in your mouth. The big takeaway from this study, and this is part of their conclusion, the study concluded that the length of fasting time directly correlated with both weight loss and metabolic benefit. There was direct correlation between how much time goes between you sticking food in your mouth and the massive benefits that you receive. So again, if you want to look at this on your own, you want to read it, you want to go through it, uh, the show notes for this podcast uh, will have a link in it for you. Let's talk about what you should do if you want to start intermittent fasting now and you want to try this losing weight thing. I find that when I speak to people about intermittent fasting, they freak out at the thought of of missing breakfast, for example. They're like, oh my God, how, you know, I just, how can I do it? 
if you suggest to them that they that they go 16 hours without a calorie and then you know eat their meals for the day in an 8 hour window they just they find that it's impossible on the other hand there's some people that have consulted with me and I've talked to that jump right into a 16 8 and before you know it they're doing a 24 or a 23 and 1 or you know or omad one meal a day um so no matter who you are, this will work. Whether you're a jump right into a 16-8 kind of person or whether you're a work your way up kind of person, I'm going to go through this as if you are a work your way up kind of person, terrified by the thought of going a few hours without eating. If that's not you and you're a person that could jump right into 16-8, well, just keep listening because we'll get to the point you could jump in if you'd like. So this way we cover everybody. But if you're somebody that's terrified and you're like, oh, God, I, there's no way I can be, miss breakfast in the morning... You know, there's no way I could push eating back to lunch and have all my meals in by 7 or 8 in the, after, in the evening. How do you do it? Or maybe you think you could do it and you tried a couple of days and, you're just, and you fail two days in a row and you go, oh God, I can't do it. Well, fasting is like a muscle. The more you exercise it, the stronger it gets. So step one, if that's you, if, it's, if that, that what I just uh, described is you, here's what you do. You start out doing 12 and 12. I'm going to throw some times out there. I don't know what your schedule is. You just adjust your time so that they match mine in terms of hours. Okay, It doesn't have to be 6 to 6. For you, it may be 7 to 7, maybe 8 to 8 or whatever. But you're going to start out doing 12 and 12. You're going to do 12 hours of no calories, 12 hours of getting your meal in. So let's say you eat your last meal at 6 o'clock at night or 7 o'clock at night. I highly recommend you don't eat any later than 7 Okay, just don't do it. No calories after 7. You'll sleep better. You'll burn more fat. Um, just lots of good things happen when you don't eat late. So, But we're just gonna, let's just use 7 as a number. So 7 o'clock, you're done with your last meal at 7, okay? That means you started it at like 6.40, you know, and you were finished at 7. Done eating at 7. You don't put another calorie in your mouth until 7 the next morning. And I'm talking about no Coke, no sweet tea, uh, no coffee with sugar in it, no coffee with sweet and low in it, no coffee with uh, the pink packet in it. No, it's none of that. You, If you want uh, coffee, I don't know why you drink coffee that late at night, but let's say tea, you're dying for some tea. Well, there's no sweet tea. There's no unsweetened tea with uh, sweet and low in it. There's no unsweetened tea with Splenda in it. You can have unsweetened tea with nothing in it. Just pour you a glass of nice unsweetened tea and put some ice in it and drink it. It really is quite delicious. I know it takes some getting used to. But you don't drink, eat, or consume any kind of a calorie whatsoever. I highly recommend that you just only drink water and that's it. So after 7 o'clock at night, that's it. That's all you have all night. Once you make it to the next morning at 7, you can have your breakfast, okay? I'd recommend that you wait till 7 and then start trying to find your breakfast so that will at least delay you 15 or 30 minutes or whatever. And then try to make some good breakfast choices, okay? Look, you're like, I don't think I can do keto. Well, if you can't do keto, try to remove some of the carbs in some kind of a way. It's only going to help you. Let's say your choice is to go to McDonald's and get the uh, chicken biscuit. Well, don't get the chicken biscuit and the and the hash browns. Just only get the chicken biscuit. The hash browns are just extra carbs you don't need. Okay? Uh, better yet, if you can get the chicken biscuit and throw half the biscuit away so that you're only eating one half of the biscuit with the chicken, even better. You've just tossed more carbs. I'm not saying you have to do that. I'm saying it's going to help you and the benefits will be phenomenal. Nevertheless, there you go. Then you find yourself at lunch, same kind of thing. Get you a big ass salad and use some low, uh, uh, low sugar uh, salad dressing, which will either be blue cheese or ranch. That's pretty much it. And don't use all the blue cheese they bring you. And don't use all the ranch they bring you. Just get you a salad. And try to use as little of that dressing as possible. Eat that salad first. 
then move on to whatever the meal is. Let's, you know, I don't know what you got. What did you get? Fried chicken and something? Well, if you got fried chicken, peel the crispiness off. If you feel like you got to have some of the crispiness, eat you a bite of the crispiness. And then just eat the regular meat for the rest of it. Because that's more carbs. And if it comes with a biscuit or a roll or something, just avoid that. Or only eat half of it. Or only eat a quarter of it. Put some of it down. And then be smart with your sides. Don't get mashed potatoes and corn. You know what? You've already had a salad. That's a side. Just get one side. And, you know, try to go for something like broccoli with butter on it. Or try to go with something like roasted asparagus. Um, if you have to go with mashed potatoes, you know, you feel like you just gotta only eat three quarters of them or something. I don't know. Uh, any attempts that you can make to remove some carbs from your day is just going to help you in the end. So just be conscious of it. I ain't saying you got to go keto. I ain't saying you got to go full-blown low-carb. I'm just saying remove some of the carbs. Just be conscious of how many freaking carbs you're eating. And if you want to have that diet drink with lunch, have it. You know, have the Coke Zero or the Diet Coke or the tea with with the sweet and lower Splenda in it. That's fine. Uh, I'd say between meals, though, just drink water. That's really what you need to do. And then for dinner, same thing. Have your dinner and and be done with it by 7. That's when you hit 12 hours, right? 7 o'clock at night will hit you 12 hours. Be done with your dinner by 7. And try to remove as, pick as, you know, as many carbs off the plate as you can and still have a decent dinner. Okay? You do this for a while. I don't know how long. Only you know how long. Now, don't say you need to do it a month, and so just do it a month, because that's just BS. You don't need to do it a month. Ain't nobody needs to go a month. You know, I'm thinking three, four, five days, six days, seven days max. After seven days, you should be able to step it up. Seven days is the absolute max. And then you're going to move that fasting window. You're only going to move it four more hours. You're only going to move it four more hours. So, you finish eating at seven at night. You were going to eat at 7 the next morning. Well, you're just going to move it on move it on around to 11, 11.30, something like that. So you'll be skipping breakfast. There'll be no breakfast. Now, since you skipped breakfast, enjoy your lunch. You can have even a little bit more for lunch if you'd like. It's not an excuse for you to pig out and eat twice the lunch you would eat. But, you know, maybe you get an extra side. Maybe in, in addition to the uh, broccoli... And uh, maybe you had, uh, whatever, you had the mashed potatoes, which you, you really need to get away from those. They're nothing but just empty calories and carbs. But let's say you had them. Well, add one more side. Add some asparagus in there so you're getting asparagus and broccoli. So you're getting a little bit more in your belly, you know. Um, but don't go crazy. Then on the dinner, same thing. Try to pick as many carbs off the plate as you can and feel good about it. And be done with your dinner by 7. And we're so we're doing a 16 and 8 and you're going to do this for a maximum of seven days. You may only need three days. You may only need four. It may be seeming really easy by three or four or five or whatever. But your max is seven. And by the end of seven days, you're going to graduate. And you're going to graduate from 16.8 up to 18.6. So 18.6 means you'll be eating all of your meals between in a six-hour window. So at this point, you need to start picking what time of day you need to eat. So that's going to be from 12 to 6, you know, noon to 6. It could be 1 to 7. You know what? You may choose for it to be the morning. And for some people, that's better. I'd say for most people, it isn't. But for some people, maybe it's 7 in the morning to 1 in the afternoon. So you're having breakfast and lunch and you're not having dinner. But I'd say most people, it probably works better if they do the lunch, you know, at whatever, 12 or 1. And... um then you're done with dinner at, at uh, 6 or 7, you know? Six-hour window. Um, still a pretty reasonable window. It's not that hard to do that. That's a lot of time to eat. Um, you should only be eating two meals, and you shouldn't be snacking in between. That's the golden rule. There are no more snacks. Snacks are done. If I didn't make that clear at the beginning, forgive me. You don't snack between meals. There's no snacking between meals and there's no drinking calories between meals. Between your breakfast and your lunch, you're not drinking a Coke. You're not drinking a sweet tea. If you want to drink something, you drink water. If you want to have tea, you have it with a meal. And it needs to be un- it needs to be sweetened with a, with a 
you know, Splenda or something like that, not sugar. <clears throat> but there's none of that between the meals. Between your lunch and your dinner, there's no consuming of calories or nothing with a sweet taste or nothing like that. You're drinking water. So you only get to drink, you know, flavoredy, sweety tasting things with your meal. So that would be a, you know, Diet Coke or Coke Zero with breakfast. That would be a, a tea sweetened with Splenda at lunch. That would be, uh, you know, going back to whatever one of your favorite uh, unsweetened things is for dinner. You know, Diet Dr. Pepper or whatever. You only have those with the meal. And when you get to two meals, then you're only getting it with two meals. And there's no snacking or calories in between the meals. Once you're done with lunch, you don't eat again until dinner. Once you're done with dinner, you don't consume any kind of eating. Drinking calories is eating, so get that into your head. If you drink a calorie, that is eating. So when I say no eating, I mean no consuming any calories whatsoever. So now you've made it to 18.6, which is pretty hardcore. Um... Lots of people start noticing pretty significant weight loss at this point. Um, I'm a member of lots of different forums and uh, online groups and Facebook groups of people who have lost uh, really impressive amounts of weight by doing nothing more but making it to 18.6. 18 hours are no calories. Now you think about this. You're going without food for 18 hours. And I know you're thinking it's hard, but it's a muscle and it will grow and it will become a habit and it will become easy. It really won't be that hard. Um, so then becomes the final one. This is where you jump into big boy country. This is where, or big girl country, depending. This is where you would choose to make the step to either 20 and 4 or OMAD. Um, I find that people that jump to 20 and 4, it kind of winds up being OMAD or one meal a day because it's, it's hard to eat two meals in a four hour period. But this would be basically your wait until the afternoon. And you're eating between 4 in the afternoon and 8 at night. Or you're eating between 3 in the afternoon or 8 at night for 20 and 4. So you're once you're done with that, once you get outside of that 4-hour window, you're not consuming any calories for 20 hours. The reason I say there's not doesn't seem to be that much difference between 20 and 4 and OMAD is because it's hard to eat two full meals in 4 hours for most people. So what I find is that most people that try to do 20 and 4... Their first meal will be more like a snack kind of meal. And by snack, I don't mean garbage or anything. I mean it'll just be a much smaller meal. So let's say that they're doing um, uh, they're doing th- uh, three to seven. Okay. Or three, or, yeah, three to seven, four to eight, whatever. Three to seven. So at three o'clock, they might have a salad. Um you know, a salad and a Diet Coke, but a nice big salad, a salad that's like three, you know, three, 400 calories or whatever, uh, with a good, you know, low sugar, low carb salad dressing like ranch or blue cheese. And then as they get close to the end of that four hour window, they may choose to have their actual meal and be bigger. You know, it might be chicken and whereas you normally eat one piece of chicken, you might eat two. So then you have, you know, two pieces of chicken and your couple of sides. Uh, have another salad in there. Uh, beef it up. It's, it's going to be a big meal. Because after that, you're done. And you can eat to your stuffed. I generally find that you can eat to your stuffed, which is one of the great things about intermittent fasting. These calorie restriction folks never get to eat to their stuffed. They never get to feel that again. With intermittent fasting, you still get to feel it. And if you're like me, that's important. I'm an eat till I'm stuffed kind of guy. I always have been. I want to feel full. I want to feel stuffed. I almost want to feel miserable. If you do intermittent fasting, you can do it. So that's the the 20 and 4. If you go to OMAD, then you really are... OMAD is really 23 and 1. You're really not eating for 23 hours and then you're eating in one hour. You can still technically have two eatings. Uh, So let's say you're you're 23 and 1. Your 1 starts at 6 in the afternoon, let's say. You know, you could have something, you know, 200, 300 calories, something good for you right at 6. And then you could wait till 645 and dig into your big, big, big meal. And it can be a big meal. (laughs) It can be a big, satisfying meal. Same rules apply. Try to get as many carbs off the plate as you can and feel comfortable about it. Um, And you have hit, you have hit... uh, almost the apex of the intermittent fasting uh, world. 
there's just one further step that you could go. And I would advise doing either a 20 and 4 or a 23 and 1 for a couple of weeks before you try it. But if you've made those a couple of weeks and you're ready to make the big leap, you can go to alternate day fasting. And let me tell you something, alternate, alternate day fasting, you will drop weight like nobody's business. The weight will fall off. I mean, it'll just melt right off of you. What does something like that look like? Well, what you're going to do is you're going to wake up on your eating day and um, you, can eat, uh, you can eat breakfast. Um, but I wouldn't get too crazy about breakfast. I'd make it low carb as I could and I'd make it small as I could. Then you're going to get to lunch and you're going to get eat you a nice lunch. Once again, same rules. Pick as many carbs off the plate as you can and be comfortable with it, okay? Just try to minimize your carbs. And you're only drinking flavored or sweet tasting drinks and not sugary drinks, sweet tasting made with other alternative sweeteners when you're eating the meal. That's the only time you're drinking them. So you have you a nice big hearty lunch. Then you have you a nice big hearty dinner. At, let's say you're done with it by 7 o'clock at night. But when you're done at 7 o'clock at night, your fasting window begins and there is nothing but water, unsweet tea, and black coffee. That's the same rules. That's the only thing you can drink. There's no sweet tasting, nothing. It needs to be mostly water, but you can't have some unsweet tea and you can't have some black coffee. And at 7 o'clock it starts. And you go to go to bed, you're sleeping most of it off, you wake up the next day, and you're going that whole day without food. Now, that is much different than what you were been doing. You were already going to 7 o'clock at night. So the only difference is, is once you get to 7 o'clock at night, that's when you would normally be eating that one meal a day. Well, you're just skipping that meal. And it's just a few hours till you're in bed. You go to bed, you sleep all the way around to the next morning, and you can start back eating at the same a.m. time as your p.m. time when you stopped. So let's say on Monday you stopped at 7 p.m. You, you're not eating Tuesday. Wednesday at 7 a.m. you can start back eating again, and that will have put you at a 36-hour fast. It's basically 36 and 12. You're going 36 hours without calories, and then you're eating three meals in a 12-hour window. The, the weight will melt off of you like nobody's business. Now, none of those are considered extended fast. None of those are considered long fast. None of those are considered dangerous fasts. 99.9999% of people in the world can do those fasts with no problem. You have to have some kind of very specific illness to prevent you from doing those. Now, here's the beautiful thing about fasting, and this is what I'm going to leave you with. The beautiful thing about fasting and why it is such a great to intermittent fasting why intermittent fasting is such a great life long weight loss and then weight control. Once you ever hit your goal weight, you can still continue to use it as a weight control tool. Why it is such a great tool is that it's so flexible. Um, let's say that you've been doing, you've made your, your way all the way up to where you're doing the alternate day fasting. So you're going one whole day without eating, right? But then let's say you have some friend come into town and they're gonna, they want to have dinner with you on that day that you're supposed to not eat, be eating any food. Well, it's no problem. Just revert back to the 23 and 1 or the 20 and 4. Just revert back to it. And so when you eat, let's say they're coming in on Tuesday. So when you eat on Monday at 7, you'd normally be going all the way to Wednesday morning at 7 a.m. because you do an alternate day. No, just back it up and have dinner with them at 7 p.m. on Tuesday and that's made it a, two, you, you, a one meal a day. It's, it's just, it's amazing. Let's say some weird day comes up to where you have, um, I don't know what kind of weirdness you have, it's some kind of breakfast with your child day at school. And you're like, oh, crap. I mean, that's, I got to eat. Oh, I don't want to miss that with my kid. Well, for that day, you know, you're just going to do, um, you're gonna do like a like a you do like a fourteen and and uh, fourteen and whatever, <laughs> fourteen and fourteen and twelve, fourteen and four. I can't do the math. Not fourteen and four. <laughs> It'd be fourteen and ten. Oh my god! So you'd do a fourteen and ten that day. You'd fast for fourteen hours, 
And then when that breakfast time came up, then you you know you'd be eating a little earlier and you'd be going a little later. And then whenever you finish your meal that night, you don't have nothing special the next day. You can jump right back into doing one meal a day. You could jump right back into doing alternate day. You could jump right back into doing sixteen eights or eighteen sixes, and you have the freedom to work this around your life. The one caveat to that is I've seen people that that make excuses for almost every day of the week so that they're never really fasting. You know, you got to make sure that those occasions where you don't fast like you've been doing the fast are real, you know, they're real out of the ordinary things. Because look, friends could talk you into going to eat with them every day if you listen to them. You got to have the cojones to go, no, I do intermittent fasting. I don't eat lunch every day. I don't eat till dinner. So you got one or two things. You can skip lunch with them. And you can go to a park or something and look at nature and enjoy the day. Or you can go to lunch with them and choose to sit there and drink a glass of water and enjoy conversation with them. Contrary to popular belief, and me and a friend of mine were talking about this the other day. Contrary to popular belief, you can go to a restaurant with some people and enjoy your time with them immensely and laugh and joke and gossip and do all the things you do normally at lunch with your friends and never eat anything. Just drink you a glass of water. I know that seems far-fetched. I know that seems outlandish, but it can be done and you can enjoy yourself, um, which is really the goal we should all be getting to. I mean, society has conflated food with emotions to where it doesn't seem like you're enjoying anything if you're not shoving something in your mouth. I can't enjoy your birthday if I'm not shoving something in my mouth. I'm not enjoying lunch with you if I'm not shoving something in my mouth. You know, it doesn't matter what we do. I've got to be cramming food down my throat and that's, but that's a problem. Why can't you enjoy time with people without having to shove food down your mouth? We should be able to. So, there you go. I hope that these things have helped you. I hope that um, it's given you something to think about. And I hope with everything that's within me um, that you will, uh, you know, find a way to grasp hold and take control of your health. Thank you so much. Follow us on social media. I appreciate it. Fat Guy Podcast is the username. Shoot me a message for questions. I try to help as much as I can. And by all means, do a couple things. If you haven't already subscribed to this podcast, subscribe wherever you get podcasts. Uh, we were just added to where you can find us. I can't think of the name, but there's a new Android app now, and it's the most downloaded podcasting app on Android now. I think they had like 9 million downloads in a week or something. Can't think of the name of it. But nevertheless, it'll probably be number one if you if you have Android and you can go to look for it because it's blowing up right now. We're on that format. There's hardly anywhere you can look for podcasts and not find us. And if you know where to find us and you know how to give us a rating, please give us a five star. If we've helped you in some way, please leave a lovely comment and go listen to this podcast, open my eyes to this, or help me in this kind of way, or, or whatever, and that'd be greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, and we'll talk to you next time.